Uh, and thanks very much for the invitation. Thanks uh, for coming. Um, as you said, uh, one of our goals is um, to bring the sense of smell to robots, to build robots that, um, that can smell in some way, gas-sensitive robots, and this is called robot olfaction. Um, as uh, Sami mentioned, um, I'm coordinator of Iliad, but this is n not what I will talk uh, today about. It's, this is a project where it's, which is about logistics, um, robotics in logistics, but today I will uh, only talk about pollution monitoring and how mobile systems can actually um, be useful in this context. So what I want to do is, um, can you, you can see this here on the agenda, I will start with an introduction to air pollution and robot olfaction. So why do we think that it is uh, useful and worth our time to study olfaction on robots? And then I want to go through uh, different um, application scenarios and different um, dimensions basically, um, which one is the scale. I start with a larger scale, urban scale, where um, you try to get a good impression on a relatively high resolution about the pollution levels in an, uh, a town, in an urban environment. And uh, the second dimension is mobility. Here it is passive mobility, that means you have a sensor and it's attached to a car or a bus and it just goes wherever the, the car um, or the, the bus is moving to. So you have to deal with that. And then I move away from that gradually to more uh, autonomy. Um, first, I look into a, um, a project that we had where we were indoors, looking at uh, pollution levels, uh, in this case dust concentrations, particulate matter concentrations um, in work environments, and how we can actually um, try to use robots together with uh, sensor networks in order to um, create 24-7 uh, maps that tell us what is the exposure of the workers in this area. And then I go towards more autonomy um, and uh, again smaller outdoor areas where I look at the important problem of detecting uh, methane, which is an important driver for uh, climate change. Uh, much more potent than CO2 and um, here we, ha we are looking at the robot that is fully autonomous that can decide where to measure um, the uh, next time and then finally I will give a, a, a small glimpse because this is a collaboration uh, with Munich with DLR um, where we opposed to the first three parts two three and four uh, we try to integrate um, the knowledge that we actually have from physics about gas dispersion, these are primarily data driven. And in uh, section five, we are looking at ways on how we can actually include the knowledge that is, uh, so to speak, encoded in the partial differential equations uh, that describe uh, gas dispersal. And then I summarize, and in the uh, PDF that I will then put online, there will also be the references. Okay. So, first of all, uh, why is air pollution so important and how can maybe robot olfaction or uh, generally all uh, systems for pollution monitoring that include mobile units, how can it help to deal with the problem? And I start with um, an example that I actually found in this uh, book of Yuval Noah Harari. Uh, probably many of you know that. He's a, a historian. Um, and uh, writes quite interesting and, and nice to read books. And he compares the number of people uh, that are killed by terrorists per year um, since 9-11 with the number of uh, deaths that are attributed to air pollution. So do you know how many people are killed by terrorists every year in Europe, USA or worldwide? Somebody have an idea. Sorry? Worldwide? Oh. Yeah. So it's actually uh, worldwide, it's 25,000. In Europe, it's 50. In the USA, it's 10. And worldwide, it's 25,000. So if you, um, there you include uh, really dangerous areas like Iraq, Afghanistan, Pakistan, and so on. So this 
these are numbers that um, like each of them is too many but these are re relatively small numbers that that actually cause a lot of attention on the other hand if you go to the web page of the world world health organization and you look at air pollution and what you can find there is that killed by air pollution every year is seven million people so this is the, the magnitude of course killing here is something different so um, these are basically um, numbers that are undisputed not maybe in the absolute extent so people usually say it's millions whether it's seven or eight there maybe there can be a discussion but what you find here is or how you find these numbers is that you do cohort studies which compare people who live uh, with higher uh, exposure to air pollution uh, and people who don't uh, and then you determine how many pe how many actually die before they reach their life expectancies and that's about seven million now um, the the actual numbers here for 2019 are that 4.2 million of those premature deaths uh, they are linked to ambient air pollution so outdoors um, and what causes uh, these uh, fatalities are heart disease so uh, heart attacks strokes then um, uh, the COPD lung cancer and uh, infections of the respiratory tract so that is actually what uh, what causes the um, uh, these, these high numbers and then we have uh, also a high amount of um, fatalities linked to indoor air pollution and as you already see these two uh, these two numbers actually add up to eight million or you know like before I used the, the number from the book which is seven million so whether it's seven or eight is, is unclear but it's millions and uh, as a conclusion the World Health Organization states that 91 percent of the world's population lives in places where air quality exceeds uh, the World Health Organization guideline limits uh, that means that it uh, the air quality is poorer than the limits uh, they set so and um, if we talk about air pollution then we first of all we, th we think of uh, mega cities where this is actually also uh, the most dramatic like for example recently uh, in, in Delhi uh, there was uh, like a, over a prolonged period of time um, flights were cancelled uh, schools were closed because of that uh, but actually if you look at international maps um, which show badly polluted air and also the place where where I have an apartment uh, Stuttgart in Germany uh, appears here and uh, since I'm here at the moment in Germany I looked up the numbers from 2019 so if we look only at one pollutant which is uh, fine particles then Germany has uh, actually a number of 60,000 people um, where a premature death is attributed to this pollutant um, you, you will actually find this number in like in different versions so I think it, with the number of premature deaths it uh, sounds most dramatic if you look at the number of years uh, lost per 100,000 inhabitants then I think this number is uh, is a, is a bit smaller <laughs> okay did I say that <laughs> um, right uh, so you you actually uh, can also find a number that that tells you how many years are lost um, per uh, uh, per inhabitant and that actually if you um, divide this by the total number of people then it, it actually leads to a relatively small uh, number you know then you can say well if divided by the whole population then uh, the number of years lost is actually just 2.6 days uh, but we have actually only a fraction of people who are affected uh, in a negative way and they actually lose several years so it is an important problem and also Munich actually appears in the recent report of the European Union about air quality as uh, the 
town in Germany that had the highest annual meal concentration of uh, nitrogen dioxide. So it's actually uh, almost 80 uh, micrograms per uh, cubic meter and 40 is, uh, is the limit value. Actually Germany has two, 40 is for uh, people and 30 is for ecosystem. So um, in any case Munich is, uh, is much higher uh, than the limit. Okay, so I already mentioned uh, nitrogen dioxide as a pollutant. Um, you have others uh, that actually have a, a strong effect. We are talking about particulate matter. Uh, this is specifically a problem because these are small particles um, that can actually enter the lung and can penetrate the lung and can enter the blood. Um, we have uh, ground level ozone and then we have also sulfur dioxide uh, which uh, contributes to acid rain. So the problem is big and now how can actually um, robotics and mobile systems for air pollution, how can they help? The general idea is, is relatively simple. We have a, a robotic base that can actually um, usually localize itself and has the mobility and then we add gas sensors. They look like that. Uh, they there are many different principles, especially uh, you can distinguish two important principles. One is called in situ sensing, where you really look at, for example, chemical reactions uh, that happen at the place where the sensor is. Uh, or you have something like this, uh, which is a remote gas sensor, where you have a um, spectroscopic principle where you uh, shoot out a laser beam and you measure the total absorption along the ray uh, which means that you measure the total concentration that you have been exposed, that the ray has been exposed to along its whole path. So these are the two, um, import, these are two important principles but in general you will have to operate with a large number of sensors and then the robot can also, a robot can also carry other sensors that are important in order to model air pollution. Uh, and these are most important wind sensors, anemometers, um, but also uh, 3D sensors in order to model the environment, to know about the obstacles. Uh, and uh, thermal cameras could also be useful because the thermal gradient is also a driver of gas dispersal. And then we put everything together on a robot that looks like this one. This is our GasBot 2.0. Um, and then we have an autonomous um, pollution monitoring station. This is the level of autonomy that I want to reach during my presentation. But I will start with um, these Google Street View cars that have been equipped with a, um, basically a mobile sensor uh, that is the equivalent to the um, measurement station that stations that you uh, sometimes see in the towns here. So I want to start with uh, this part and uh, look at the urban scale and passive mobility because we are talking about a car that actually uh, drives uh, on a pre-described um, path through the town again and again and measures simply measures uh, air pollution levels uh, in order to find out how big the, uh, the variance is actually. So um, these experiments that I will talk about here uh, were actually done uh, by the University of Texas um, together with, uh, um, uh, with the Department of Civil and Environmental Engineering uh, in Washington and um, I only worked with those data uh, with a PhD student at, at Cornell, uh, so I'm not, I was not part of this original study. Uh, it's important that this is a, um, a study that actually covered two years. I will uh, talk here about the first part, which is a full year, uh, where two Google Street View uh, cars were used uh, with this high-end gas measurement system. Um, especially uh, the, the pollutants that uh, were measured here are black carbon, uh, carbon monoxide and the carbon dioxide that we just uh, saw that Munich, that was so strong uh, in Munich. Okay, the important goal in general is to increase the spatial resol resolution. We usually have a very low number of measurement stations 
And um, a key question is, do they represent the, the uh, variance of uh, measurements that, or the variance of air pollution in a town, do they uh, like represent this well? Or how much does it make a difference where I actually put this measurement station? Um, yes, and uh, a second question is, how stable are those pollution patterns over time? Is, is this predictable at all? The, the goal is to achieve high-resolution air, uh, high air pollution monitoring, uh, which currently is uh, not existing. Um, and generally, pollution me uh, measurements uh, are um, very sparse. For many areas, you don't even have it. Uh, and then for uh, some towns, you have like one or two stations, for example, in this um, European report that I mentioned before, it considers 112 German cities where uh, there are measurement stations, so it's very sparse. And uh, equipping um, cars or buses could, could help here. And then, of course, it's uh, what I already said. It's uh, the question how well the central side monitors represent air pollution. Okay. And then, yeah, the conclusion is that, of course, it has transformative uh, potential. Right, so now a uh, little bit more in, in uh, detail uh, of this Oakland measurement campaign. As I said before, it's, um, uh, it's one year of driving through the town and measure, uh, measuring. And then in the second year, there was um, like the, the, the whole experiment was repeated with a bit fewer measurements. I will actually just mention a few of those results as well. Um, the cars were driving six to eight hours. Uh, per day, or both cars were driving um, six to eight hours, and uh, they were driving under all weather conditions. The paper just mentions that there were sometimes the weather was so bad that they couldn't drive. I don't know what exactly that was, mm -hmm. but otherwise uh, they just drove every day and uh, also measured everything they could measure. So if they were in a traffic jam uh, behind a car, that, that actually was also a measurement that went into this data set. Um, about 150 days were measured in this, in this period um, and uh, maybe to characterize uh, the environment here, uh, San Francisco, um, between San Francisco and Mountain View, here is that the wind direction is very stable. So you have wind towards the west here uh, that is very stable over time. So this is a, a diagram of all the, uh, of the wind measurements over the whole time uh, and relatively, yeah, I don't know, average with four meters per second. Okay, now what are the results here? First of all, um, the measurement campaign actually led to um, three uh, times 10 to the power of six measurements at one hertz in this area of 30 square kilometers. And um, yeah, 750 uh, road kilometers were driven through again and again. And now we look at uh, the central area where um, the uh, results are most um, important. Uh, in order to um, analyze the results, 30 meter road segments uh, were uh, decided on and uh, this actually led to 16,000 such segments, basically like a, a, a grid map or like putting uh, grid cells along the street, and then all the measurements were assigned to one of those uh, cells. They were snapped to those. This actually leads to um, a picture like that. Here it shows the drive days, shows that the cars basically always or most of the time uh, drove along the, the, red, um, uh, the red streets, and also here we can see a map that shows the number of uh, measurements. Now we see that the cars were often driving here, but we don't have that many samples in this area, it's simply because the cars on these streets drive fast, therefore they pass through the segments pretty quickly. In an attempt to um, classify how uh, these typical road segments look like is that they contain 
most of the time between 150 and 250 individual samples um, of 20 to 50 distinct days. So this is the statistics that is collected in this data set. Now if we look at the results here, um, then because you know, like uh, we put in all the measurements, uh, it seems to make sense to use the median as a representative of uh, the, all the measurements per cell. And then we get a picture like this. Now in order to um, um, get a better idea of what that means, we can look at the, uh, at the limits that we have here in Germany. So we have, for example, an annual um, limit of 40 micrograms per cubic meter. Remember Munich was at about 80. And uh, here uh, the concentrations are actually given in parts per billion and uh, what a, the a relation between microgram per square meter and parts per billion depends on the temperature. So we have, so it's actually in, in this range between 0 and 25. Uh, degrees. So here is, uh, is our uh, limit value. And what we then immediately see is if we look at the uh, uh, snapshot of this inner area where the uh, central monitor is, is that the central monitor that is at 10.4 parts per billion, that's below uh, the limit that we have in Germany. Um, but then you have um, isolated spots. And remember, these are measurements over a whole year, then you have these isolated spots uh, where you have double the exposure. So if you have asthma, for example, you certainly shouldn't live in these areas. And nobody knows. If you don't have um, these cars driving around sampling the environment, then you simply don't know. For some of the areas, you, you can guess because they are here, for example, is at the entry uh, to an industrial area, um, but for some areas it's, it's not quite clear why there are these high uh, pollution levels. Okay, so the first conclusion here is that there are, there is a strong variance. So the, um, the pollution levels actually vary a lot if you only move a few hundred meters, or if you only move 30 meters. Um, and the deviations from these central monitors are pretty high, um, which means, you, you can say actually this is a, a, like it's representing the uh, pollution levels not well, but you can also conclude that it's very important where you measure uh, your uh, pollution data. So, if I said Munich has uh, very high nitrogen dioxide levels, that could mean that they are extremely high in this town or that they are very honestly measured. So we, for example, we had uh, several attempts to make uh, projects or like to start projects where we monitor pollution levels um, and some, sometimes they were suddenly stopped when um, the discussion reached the engineers who were actually um, involved in setting up the stations, which led us to the conclusion that maybe the measurement stations were very well placed. So that's one conclusion that, that you can drive, uh, derive from, from that uh, graph. Okay, so uh, the spatial vari variability dominates the total variability. That's actually in this number if it's close to one then uh, the variability over, uh, you know, like the, along the street is much higher than within the segments. Um, and almost for all the um, different politons and for the different uh, row types, it's close to one. Um, and then, uh, like a, a second conclusion, uh, that's actually of the follow-up paper here, uh, that appeared in 2018, is that you can try to um, reduce the sampling effort by using uh, so-called land use regression uh, extrapolation models, land use regression cridging, where you bring in knowledge about the use of the area. So is this an industrial area? Is this um, like you know, uh, a park and so on? And to some degree here we see um, the 
um, the, the modeling error to some degree if you use this uh, land use regression you can actually with sampling only a few days you can pretty quickly uh, reach very good model or like good models but if you want to uh, if you want to reach models that represent also all the small variations, all the hotspots, well, then you actually have to sample, and you have to sample, um, you know, like a substantial amount of days. It's only in this way that you uh, find the hotspots. And here I just have as a last picture, I have uh, the different, some different results here. So this is the f uh, uh, a model from the full data set. Um, a model that actually is subsampled by using only four driving days per segment and here you have for example a hotspot that then disappears in the full data set that is uh, a mistake that you can do and this is the model from uh, land use regression which you know like looks fairly good but it does not rep represent uh, like small variations very well okay so this was uh, at the urban scale and where the sensors are just uh, um, attached to a car. And uh, now we w want to look at, or I want to look at the uh, work environment um, where we had a, a project in Sweden together with foundries. And here we now look at mobile robots. We actually set up this robot for a, a different project, which I will uh, mention in the next part, and we were quite happy with it. And then uh, we got this request from, uh, from these industrial partners who are working in such environments and w where the workers are exposed to um, very high particulate matter concentrations, very high dust levels, so to speak. Um, and then we said, yeah, we have a robot, um, we can actually build one or two of them and then monitor the, um, the dust levels uh, over time. So we actually imagined it to be like that, our robot in this environment. <coughs> but then our partner said this is, this is not possible for us uh, because we cannot guarantee uh, that the robot can access the area at any time. It might be because they have uh, sometimes very high workloads, sometimes uh, rather low. It very much depends on the uh, uh, price of ore on the uh, world market. Um, that during sometimes the robot simply cannot be there. So our first uh, solution here that we had in mind, just using the robot um, and with full autonomy, did not. Uh, was not possible there. So we decided uh, for a different way in which the robot could be useful here. This here is, is one of the environments where we, uh, where we actually um, developed uh, this project. And uh, what we, how we set the whole thing up is that we use a stationary network of gas sensors, uh, in this case dust sensors, and uh, for the purpose of this presentation, it doesn't matter whether they are yellow or, or red. Um, and then the question is, well, usually workers are not here at the wall where you want to attach the, the sensors, um, simply also because you have electricity here and so on. But the really important areas are usually in between. And the question is, how do we extrapolate basically from these measurements to the really um, important areas. And for this purpose, we use a robot. So we, we actually have the robot that we can send in at some times into this area, and then it can measure over, especially at, at uh, places where people are, in order to update a model that interpolates, that allows us to interpolate as good as possible uh, the values that we measure with the stationary network. So the robot here has the purpose to update this interpolation model. And that also, uh, by the way, um, includes calibration of um, uh, the, the measurements of those different nodes here. So what you then usually have is you have sensor nodes like these ones here. Uh, they measure dust concentration at one hertz, humidity and temperature. Uh, and since you have to um, have many of them, those are 
are using rather inexpensive sensor technology, while on the uh, robot you, you would have uh, more expensive uh, equipment, uh, for example, um, particle counters that don't only tell you this is particulate matter, but also what type it is, for example, PM10 or PM2.5, so like the very fine particles or fine particles, um, and anemometers to measure wind, uh, for example, as well. Okay, this is not so important. Um, now, if we look at the equipment here, we have the inexpensive sensors, which are attached uh, to the environment. Uh, here, we have use uh, sensors from Sharp, and we have a more expensive uh, part of the equipment, which is the dust track sensor, uh, which is carried by the robot. And now, we, we actually look, here you see the, this unit, the dust track unit mounted on the robot. Um, and you also see uh, a note which is for the first experiment also mounted for the first experiments also mounted on the robot to see the correlation between those two sensors. In general, we will have a number of um, uh, sensors attached, inexpensive sensors attached to the wall. They measure um, what I, what I uh, mentioned already, dust concentration uh, and temperature and humidity. Then we put all that as input into, in this case we use the echo state network, but you know, like it's a function approximator here uh, that is learned. Um, and we also use the sensor position. And then we try to, with this, we try to uh, predict what the robot measures at the different places. <coughs> Right? Uh, and in order to characterize the sensors that we are using, we first closed the loop here and used the uh, values of the inexpensive sensor in order to, with this echo state, state network, in order to predict the values with the expensive, more accurate sensor. And uh, you know, like we put in all the measurements we had here uh, and all the values also about airflow, robot pose and robot speed. And in the first evaluation, uh, feature selection uh, with uh, weighted um, entropy, we basically saw that only temperature seemed to be important. And um, if we look at the raw measurements here between the inexpensive and the expensive sensor, then we get a correlation of 0 0.71. If we use also the neural network and the actual concentration measurements, uh, this is increased. And strangely enough, if we also looked at the temperature, then we got a, a very high correlation. And this is a word of warning here. Um, there is actually no real dependency on the temperature. Uh, and what happened after looking at the 14 hours of data which were used here, uh, we saw that uh, the, the actual, like the reason for this high correlation here is that the inexpensive sharp sensor saturates at some point uh, and then it cannot predict you know how high the peak actually over this level is. So, but in this data set, it, uh, it happened that this, these peaks, they occurred at areas where the temperature was different. So uh, in cross-validation, the temperature could be used in order to uh, predict the different uh, peak levels here. And that's why we don't use it actually here, because there's no uh, explanation from physics. And we only use the, uh, the actual concentration measurements. Now, uh, the whole system, you can see here, uh, looks like that. We have robot moving in the environment. We have the sensors uh, of the stationary network, which are attached to the wall and uh, form the input. And then we have an echo state network. Um, if you're interested in that, I can uh, explain uh, that offline. Uh, but for our purposes, you can, um, can basically um, understand this as a function approximator uh, where only the output layer, so one vector has to be trained, the reservoir is, is basically given, um, and then we can actually send a robot to a place and train the particular output uh, vector uh, there. So we send it to this place and learn uh, this vector at that place, at that place, at that place, at that place, mm -hmm. and then the question is how do we um, 
figure out what's happening in between. We, we cannot, or also here, we cannot measure all the uh, places of interest. Uh, and for the interpolation here, we use Gaussian processes directly on those vectors. Results. Um, here you see uh, dust concentration, dust distribution maps. Um, for example, in this case, the yellow areas are uh, 7,150 micrograms. So these are much higher values than we uh, looked at before. And um, if we actually use uh, Gaussian process regression only on those, those values, so in order to predict the, um, the measurement values that we get with a robot from the stationary network, then we make an error of 600 micrograms, or so 690 micrograms per uh, cubic meter. Um, so in comparison to 7,000 here. And if we use the echo state network, uh, the approach that we actually uh, suggested here, then we can roughly half that. So this is a nice result, but I think more importantly is, uh, more important here is the way that the robot is used. So we basically um, come from a common practice that uh, does not provide uh, high sampling density, neither temporally nor spatially. Here for these uh, partners, the, common, the, the practice at the moment is that uh, one day per year, one worker gets um, like a measurement device and then wherever this worker walks to this day, that's measured, integrated, and this is the measurement. That's basically uh, what tells them um, how they should structure their environment in, in order to reduce exposure. However, now um, with a robot, you can actually achieve a high spatial, a high spatial density of measurements. So it can be spatially dense, but it's temporarily sparse because you know, like the robot can only be like at the place where it is. On the other hand, with the sensor nodes, they provide high uh, temporal uh, density of measurements, uh, but sparse, uh, like spatially sparse me measurements, because they uh, can only be at a few places. And by combining that, we get relatively high uh, spatial density and temporal density as well. So this is the general principle here. So that was one remark where I think that uh, this is an important and novel application for robots. A second remark uh, that, that actually um, um, led us to start a, a new research direction was that in the course of this project we also looked at um, uh, at wind maps, at ways to figure out how, a, uh, how airflow is distributed over the environment. So um, the robot has uh, an, an anemometer, a wind measurement device, and some of the stationary sensors have that as well. And from that we can actually predict the airflow. Uh, we did that um, during the project and we showed, oh, sorry, and we showed these maps to the people who run the facility and they said, yeah, it looks nice, but that's not how it is. So we designed the, the ventilation system completely differently and then they measured and then they saw that it was actually not as they, uh, that it was like it was shown on the map and not as what they thought it'd be. And that's, it's, it's very uh, simple to understand because uh, you, never can um, take into account all, you usually when you model how a ventilation system actually affects the airflow, you usually assume empty rooms. And uh, in these environments where you have huge obstacles, where you have like very hot areas and very cold ones, the airflow will actually develop differently. And that means that you have pockets, isolated pockets where the concentration is high, which is very hard to know about. And, it, and for us it led us uh, to start this direction of ventilation characterization. You can send a robot into a building in order to find out how the airflow pattern actually is. And then you can compare this to uh, the airflow that you actually wanted and maybe also find ways to um, to change it in the way that you intend to. And we also uh, looked at how those wind patterns change over time 
um, which uh, was interesting because we, we could actually detect uh, frequencies of change there which correspond to the, uh, to the industrial processes that they lead. So for us, the important thing here is that we now also see robots as a way to uh, really characterize ventilation systems, which for example is extremely important in mines, but also in intelligent uh, buildings. There's also interest there. And then generally, so here to conclude, uh, we have uh, basically um, shown that robots here um, can be useful together with a, a sensor networks, network and so far I was looking at a semi-autonomous uh, solution. So the robots were actually um, allowed to be there sometimes. We didn't look so much at uh, the problem of uh, informative uh, path planning, or like uh, planning where like uh, are the most informative places, but we considered this in general as a possibility also if uh, the sensors here are attached to uh, forklift trucks, for example, then the forklift truck could tell the human driver, if possible, go to this area or that area. But it's still semi-autonomous. And now in the next part, I will come to uh, a fully autonomous uh, solution for um, gas, me gas measurements with this remote gas detection principle. So here the application is to detect methane because methane can be very well detected with one of those uh, remote gas sensors and uh, we, we work together here uh, with companies who are um, interested in um, landfill sites and we, in Erdebrew we have two landfill sites that actually uh, produce methane that is then used in order to heat the hospital. So the robots were supposed then to drive around on those landfill sites. They just look like normal, you know, like normal area. You just, it's just rubbish covered with a, a sheet of uh, plastic um, with some exhausts where you actually uh, get the methane. But over the years, because these uh, landfill sites are decommissioned for 30 years now, over the years the plastic sheets get cracks and about 50% of the methane escapes which is like an economical issue because you, otherwise you would, that, that would actually be useful. Uh, but it's also um, an environmental concern because uh, methane is actually, um, I think like 35 times more potent as uh, greenhouse gas than uh, carbon dioxide. So we use here this particular sensor. I mentioned that already before. The principle is like that. You, you send out a laser ray. Uh, this laser ray is reflected at some point. You don't need specific reflectors. You can just point it to the, uh, to the floor. Um, and let's say it, it passes through the, f the first meter, meter through background concentration. 10 parts per million. And then it's again uh, goes through uh, 10 parts per million, one meter, and there's only one meter where there's a higher concentration of 500 parts per million, which means that in the end you will integrate all that and you will get a reading of 590 parts per million times meter. So you don't get a localized um, measurement and you can't immediately say whether this measurement is caused by a background concentration of 59 parts per million or this distribution that we see here. So um, we actually have to start with um, we have to start with developing a method uh, that does this uh, that solves this um, issue of how do I get from a set of these integral measurements how do I get a localized car. This is a tomographic problem. Just with the difference that uh, the um, environment that I look at different from tomography changes uh, all the time. So this may be uh, a gas distribution here and um, in the first part I look at, at mapping. So what we do here, and I, I just summarize this, what we do here is we send out the robot, we model the environment, um, we do that so that we know the full geometry of every uh, measurement that we do, so that we know exactly how uh, where was the ray reflected, how long was it, which uh, parts did it pass, 
and then we carry out uh, specific measurement sequences here. So uh, the, it's basically the sensor is mounted on a pan tilt unit and moved in, in uh, sequence over the environment. Then we move the robot uh, to a next position, sample from there, and so on and so on, collect a, a number of measurements, and then find the best explanation in terms of uh, a local gas concentration map of all those measurements. Right? Um, I have a very quick um, way to visualize this here. So um, one measurement may look like that. Here you had the sensor on the robot. The robot was pointing at a point on the floor here, just uh, so that you have a rough idea. Uh, that actually works on up to 30 meters. So if I, if I use this sensor and uh, 30 meters away is a transparent uh, bottle with uh, methane in it, then it will detect this. And it will detect this uh, because it's an optical principle no matter whether it's in the bottle or not. Okay, so let's, let's say this is, this is the optical path and, and then our approach basically assumes a grid map uh, with cells where uh, we um, assume that the distribution for each cell is actually uh, constant and then we have for uh, parts of the of the beam we have a contribution that is proportional to the length of this segment times uh, the mean concentration in this um, in this grid cell and then we add up all the uh, all the contributions here um, and model the measurement that we get as being built from all those contributions plus uh, an, an error term and then we uh, we simply optimize here um, or, or minimize the difference between um, all those contributions that explain our measurements and the measurements itself. And we regularize this by assuming uh, that the measurements should be as, as low as possible. And uh, here I, I rushed through so just to show you um, a toy example here. Uh, so these are two nice distributions. That's not how it, uh, how it actually looks when you have freely evaporating gas, of course. Um, but then if you actually sample from the right directions here, um, then over time you are able to estimate a, a correct map and you are able to identify um, the gas sources here, which is, is important um, because then you can actually do something about it. Uh, so the company we, we worked with can actually seal those, um, those leaks on the landfill sites easily. So for in, uh, in a theoretical example, in a nice theoretical example it works. Um, and I'd also like to show you one uh, example with a real robot where we, uh, we run it in an area of about 400 square meters um, with 12 sensor positions which includes 4510 individual measurements. Here we, we actually let uh, methane freely evaporate at this point and the map that we get over the area then indicates very nicely uh, the spot where uh, the gas source was. So we were very happy. Uh, we won um, awards with this robot and I think the biggest recognition, at least um, f for my taste, was that we, that's the only robot that we have that actually got a poem in uh, an Australian children magazine. And because compared to many newspapers, they really got it. I'd like to read it here. So. Um, they said, stink bomb bag, bags of kitchen waste, little landfill smelly place, rubbish mountains by the load are burping gases that explode. Let's call gas spot methane chase, chaser, sniffing air with zapping laser, shooting out those beams of light like Star Wars, Star Wars sabers in a fight. And now it's uh, the rhyme that I like most. Sensors on a mobile robot map out where the noxious gas got. Let's call GasBot bots don't dread to go where humans hate to tread. So this is, I think, one of the nicest um, recognitions that we got. But you always um, have to stay grounded, of course. And actually, if 
you know, like I showed this nice result. And if you look at the path of the robot, which I show here, then this indicates that actually there was some knowledge of the gas source. So the robot like always looks like uh, the, the robot always uh, sampled towards the source and just moved around it. Uh, and this is actually, well, an example, like this is a result that you can get if you know already where the source is, which is exactly what we want to find out. So, so we actually had to work more on this and uh, also address the question where, how do we plan the places where the robot should go next? And in order to do that, um, we, as I already mentioned, we define this elementary sensing action where the robot stops at one place and then um, moves over a cone of a defined opening angle and a defined um, uh, distance. That's basically where the robot reaches a flat floor. Um, and then we can consider in a, in a first approximation, we can consider or we can assume that all the sources that are within those cone, uh, within this cone, uh, would be detected. So we started by looking at the problem of gas detection. How do we plan paths for the robot uh, so that it detects all the gas sources in the, in the area? And for that, um, we can define again in a grid map world, um, we have possibilities that the robot can sense, for example, uh, or can um, use this element of sensing actions oriented towards four directions. And if it's sensed in, in this direction, for example, then all those uh, yellow cells would be observed. Now the problem is actually one of coverage, and the question is, given the starting pose of the robot and given this environment, What's the, uh, what's the shortest path and what's the shortest sequence of sensing actions that actually cover the whole area? I show the solution for here. Um, this is an NP-hard problem, um, but it, we actually found, uh, you can find the details here, found an approximate solution um, that uh, compares very well to the uh, like the solution that you can, can find by brute force with small numbers of cells, with higher number of cells uh, like brute force doesn't work any longer. And uh, so we actually find a path here that guarantees us that we have seen, that we have measured all the cells so that all the, uh, under our assumptions, all the gas sources there are detected. Okay, and then the, the robot actually samples here the last time and uh, I think no, one, one time more to, to have this corner here as well, and then goes back. And this allows us to make such plans also for larger environments like this uh, campus here in Freiburg, where we use the map in order to do that. But we really want to um, plan paths for gas distribution mapping, not only for gas detection. And there it's much more difficult uh, to define the target function I uh, just uh, show here uh, how the final system looks like. So what we do is we start, well, we have some reality, uh, some gas emissions, some gas distribution that we uh, like to look at. Um, then we first run what I just showed you. We first run a planner that tries to detect all the sources, goes through, in the simplest case, uh, moves through the environment, builds a map, and then uh, comes up with what we call a course map where we can identify hotspots. And then we have to go to these hotspots and uh, sample them, them again. For this, we run uh, a study uh, with simulations, which actually uh, shows us what are the best uh, angles under which you should investigate those hotspots more. Then we put all that into an optimizer uh, and then run it again. Uh, in order to get to some reconstruction of the, the true gas distribution. I'll show you this in an uh, example here. That's a real experiment. The robot um, actually samples 360 degrees, uh, no, 270 degrees here, um, gets um, like a first indication of the hotspot, 
and because it is very time consuming to first to go through all the environment uh, and then go back and sample all the hotspots again uh, here we have the, the latest version of the algorithm that does this in an interrelated manner so it's whenever a hotspot is detected it also tries to uh, to plan for those uh, fine uh, detailed uh, analysis later on this actually means that now we have a way to ask the robot just to explore the environment, just to get back with the best gas distribution map, given only uh, the map of the environment, only the, uh, like in this case, the 2D map. And it also gave us the possibility to, sh uh, to see whether we can beat, as human experts, the, the computer, whether we can plan better paths than the, uh, than the robot. So we actually made experiments where uh, human experts, so all the participants of this study, uh, worked with gas-sensitive robots. I think you can only find that many in, in Erdogan or maybe one uh, university in China. Um, so you were given this map and then on this map you indicated where the robot should actually move next. Uh, that's the evaluation. Uh, then you point and click this in the, in the map, you said sample in this direction and then the robot actually carried uh, what, you, what you instructed it to do on the, uh, in, in your interface, it carried it out in a, a distant area. So that was about uh, three, four hundred meters away, a, a large hole, uh, I would say about 120 times 40 meters wide and there the robot then moved to the next position sampled and updated the map. Then you saw the update of the map and based on this you had to decide where uh, to go next. Um, you see that here there were uh, gas sources uh, placed in bottles. As I mentioned before, because of the optical principle it doesn't matter whether the gas is freely evaporating or in a bottle. And um, funny uh, side remark, the bottles were placed in a building uh, where there is, uh, for example, nursing and medicine. Uh, so these are uh, not, they are not related to us. And uh, the PhD student actually put up the, the bottles here and uh, put in front um, a label that says, uh, please don't touch. And on the second day of these experiments, I was having lunch with somebody from this uh, place and they told me about the art installation. <laughs> that was the most likely explanation they found. <laughs> okay, so, so basically, um, after a while, then, um, uh, like, as a human, you, um, you had to conclude, okay, now I'm pretty sure I uh, found all the sources in this area. And this, this was then compared to the human performance. And I walk you through um, the comparison here uh, quickly. So red is like the, the, the most straightforward implementation of the algorithm that I presented. So you first go through the whole environment, you detect all the sources, then you go back and then you sample all the hotspots again. Um, the blue one is uh, like the optimized version that we would suggest that tries to do everything at the same time and also does not um, put such a high um, emphasis on really sampling everything. We'll come back to this point in a second. And yellow is the human. So we as humans were pretty good in minimizing the traveling distance. And uh, we were also, which is more important here because the sensing action in itself is very costly, we were also pretty good at uh, minimizing the number of uh, sensing actions. By the way, I'm number six here, so I had the highest number of sensing actions. Um, I was very careful. <laughs> and uh, if we look at the coverage, so we see that uh, the straightforward solution guarantees 100% of sensor uh, coverage, it actually also achieves it and otherwise the uh, computer is a bit better at uh, sensing coverage, exception of me here and, and this participant number two. Um, and the solution quality, uh, interestingly, which uh, compares you know, how many uh, false positives and false negatives we, we had, is comparable. So 
these human experts who have a lot of experience um, were actually as good almost as the um, as the computer and uh, how is this possible so this this is uh, just an example of the evaluation where you see you know like uh, that's the red is is actually where we guessed the gas source is and blue is the actual gas source location um, so so this is is actually a, a pretty good result also uh, showing that the computer uh, that the sensor planning algorithm works because it does not have any um, information about the environment it cannot use any context that it infers from from the map and it also uh, must assume that a gas source can can um, be placed in any of the cells like if only one cell is left a human tends to leave it out as we see in this example so in order to sense all the cells here that's what the computer actually plans to make one elementary sensing actions in this direction and then in that direction and in this way it discovers the gas source here while the human expert just looks um, into this this corner and then says well I might I might have missed the pixel here uh, but or like a, a cell here, uh, but there won't be a, a cell. So that's why we are pretty confident that this is a uh, wh why I'm convinced this is a very nice result, especially also because it's very time consuming. Like uh, the, this experiment took about uh, two hours, uh, and in larger environments, you can just simply now give the task to a robot. Um, Unfortunately, what we have not done and what is left for future work is to do this with an actual evaporating source. We have the gas in bottles because indoors you're not allowed to um, um, like use freely evaporating uh, methane sources. Um, and it also helps us to know exactly the ground truth. It's one of the few examples, uh, one of the few experiments that we have in olfaction where we have full ground truth. Usually, when we don't see the gas, we just no, here's the gas source, but how the gas is distributed is, is hard to say. Um, and there's actually uh, no good way around it. Ground truth is, is often a problem. Okay, so now I have uh, about, let's say, 10 minutes left, and I want to give a glimpse on how we uh, actually continue to work on this problem. And now, not as not in the way that I uh, showed you before, which was basically everything was data driven. Now we look at ways, and this is a collaboration here with DLR in Munich, uh, with a PhD student there and with uh, Dimitri Shutin as the supervisor. Now we look at um, the problem of uh, including knowledge that we have from physics. Not only getting the data and then model how they, how actually a gas distribution for example may look like or where the gas source may be but also using what we actually know about gas distribution which, which is so to speak encoded in partial differential equations so the general motivation here is um, uh, that you look at the scenario where there are um, gas sources you come in with uh, a team heterogeneous teams of uh, land and um, airborne robots and you try to identify the precise location where those sources are okay the partial differential equations that describe um, dispersal of gas um, like are shown here like one partial differential equation that you can use um, just to, to give like a, a the idea about the terms, so you have F, which is the concentration field, um, the, uh, the derivative with respect to time is important, uh, then you have a term that actually connects neighbors to each other, uh, that's a diffusive term, um, and then you have advection here, which means that if you have airflow, then it also transports um, uh, the concentration that you have here with the gradient of the concentration field and all this is driven by some unknown distribution of the sources so here we have a field that has 
um, high values where the gas sources are. And that's actually what we want to estimate. Okay, so why, why do we want to use a model-based approach just to rehearse this? Um, of course, if we have knowledge from physics, then we should use it. We, it should improve um, the way in which we, or like the inference that we can make in order to find the gas source. Um, and what we will see here and what we will crucially use is also um, the, that it allows to quantify the uncertainty that we have in the current estimate so that we can go with, uh, that we can send the robots to the places where the uncertainty is highest. And in the way that the uh, method here is um, uh, developed, these uncertainties can come uh, from the actual uh, measurements, but they can also come from uh, model imprecisions. Because that's an important part that the models uh, that or the, the uh, model as, as it is actually described by the partial differential equation uh, does not describe the reality uh, fully precisely. And we, in order to deal with that, we put everything into a probabilistic approach. So the probabilistic approach uh, deals with this issue, and I just show you that. So that's um, an how a gas distribution may look like uh, approximated by the partial differential equation that I showed you. We cannot actually uh, so, like use the, uh, all the Navier-Stokes equations, uh, which would actually describe more like a realistic behavior like here, because then uh, we would lose the capability to uh, solve everything online. So the important thing here is that the probabilistic approach allows to um, deal with model uncertainties in the same way. So um, if we send a robot to places where um, uncertainty is high, this may be because the model is imprecise there, especially imprecise, or because of the measurement values. So, and just um, to, um, yeah, th that's what I just said. Um, Instead of hard constraints, we use probability density functions which allow to classify uncertainty and this gives us indications of good places to sample. For these attempts in um, this domain of uh, robot affection to inversely solve uh, the partial differential equations that I showed in order to find uh, gas source locations, they usually have uh, the assumption that you have to know the number of gas sources that are there in the environment. Um, here, because we use a Bayesian approach that allows a prior that encodes uh, that our, we make the assumption that there are few sources um, it allows us to overcome this limitation. So we make the assumption there are few sources, but we do not have to make an assumption that we know exactly how many. And then actually, um, like we can solve those equations, and now I just want to show you a glimpse on this uh, general approach. So we have uh, the, um, <coughs> the equations, the partial differential equations, and we have some measurement model, uh, we discretize this uh, over a grid and get to these uh, discrete um, equations. We also introduce a residuum in order to um, move from this hard constraint to a soft constraint. Um, then uh, we put everything here as mentioned as transformation into a basic world. We put everything into uh, posteriors and probability density functions um, and use um, uh, a sparsification prior that actually leads to uh, a preference on sparse solutions. So solutions that indicate only a few gas sources, if you look at the posterior for, for gas sources. Then uh, we model everything here by a factor graph and in this factor graph, so here for example the blue um, cubes, these are measurements, they are related uh, to the unobserved gas distribution um, and this again is related to the distribution of uh, 
uh, of sources and you know here when you look at the whole grid then you have a number of measurements so for some of those nodes you have measurements for some others you don't and then we make inference in this uh, graph actually there's one step before uh, there is a distributed implementation so that you can run this on on uh, different robots um, and run this means that you infer um, marginal distributions for each cell and for that if the robots are in those specific areas you only have to exchange messages between the connected cells here uh, that's basically in order to figure out you know like how the relations there is because the gradients there drive the, uh, the distribution with these marginal distributions for cells uh, you can um, compute the uncertainty and the uncertainty then can guide your um, uh, your search. Now, this is um, uh, uh, work that's actually um, going on for a couple of years. Uh, will be finished um, like about next year or end of this year. Um, and it went through a couple of stages. So the first stage was that's already the second stage that I show, but the first stage was uh, to evaluate it in simulation where the measurements are generated by exactly the partial differential equations that were also used. Here we have a hardware in the loop experiment where the measurements are sampled from this uh, assumed distribution and uh, then the robots move around according to the uh, strategy uh, that for sensor planning and then discover the three sources again like this is like one step to, to the full solution where we uh, have a pretty well-defined um, uh, gas distribution here then the next step here was to go again hardware in the loop simulation to how to say to go to a larger area but also in modeling to go towards the next step because what I showed you here was only diffusion that was basically um, sorry that was base oh, sorry so it was basically uh, without this part that describes advection now in the next step uh, we assume that we know uh, the wind flow field here the very uh, simple one, constant, only in one direction. And then in this larger outdoor environment, the robots move around and um, try to identify this, uh, these two gas sources. I think on the next, so this is a nice visualization of the hardware in the loop simulation, but again, the robots make simulated measurements here. And uh, here we see them again driving in this area I think that starts a bit late so here I should no, I think I can't jump here okay so we have to wait a little bit so this is the assumed distribution you also have um, the assumption that the wind field is actually constant and in one direction uh, then you have to also include in the factor graph that we saw before um, like the, the advection term and uh, then you move the robots according to the uncertainties which interestingly leads them often to areas with uh, high concentration where supposedly the um, model uncertainties are uh, big model imperfections uh, and then you have an um, like at each update step you have an estimate of the source distribution so that's a visualization of the posterior of this term u that describes this, the source distribution uh, and you have an uncertainty that dry, that can be used in order to uh, guide your robots you also get an estimate of the gas distribution there or like a full posterior over that but that is hardware in the loop and uh, like if we uh, if I let this video run for a little bit longer, also the second um, source will appear. Um, but I jump to the real world experiments. First one in a small indoor lab where you have uh, a rover with a gas sensor on top of it and this gas source uh, which is placed here in the middle. 
Um, and so you see these this white dots here is where the robot is sampling and we already have some nice solution uh, for the, the gas distribution and the, also the, the source estimation is approximating and now here it actually found the gas source and has a relatively good um, idea of the gas distribution as well. Um, as far as I know, this was also these experiments were also done with uh, fans so that we know for sure that the wind is in this direction. And therefore this plume here makes sense. Again, ground truth problem, we don't know exactly how the plume looked like, we can just say it, that is re that's a reasonable result. Okay, and the next steps already ongoing uh, is an evaluation of, gas, of the gas source localization aspect outdoors um, and very importantly also an inclusion of airflow mapping uh, because I said we make like in this hardware in the loop outdoor experiment I said we make the assumption that wind is unidirectional um, and like everywhere the same and now we um, also look at ways in which we can at the same time build a model of airflow distribution, a fully probabilistic model that then can um, also be used in order to better infer uh, the location of gas sources and so on. So these are the, the steps that are ongoing at the moment. Okay, so this brings me to a quick summary and uh, then the questions. What I wanted to tell you today is uh, first uh, that air pollution is an important problem and that is an important problem not only in places far away from us, um, that it's uh, an important problem almost everywhere. 91% of the people live in areas where air quality standards uh, fall short of the, the limits set by the World Health Organization. Um, I mentioned that this actually um, may uh, affect the, the city you are living in. And then I, I introduced the idea that uh, mobile sensing units, be it fully autonomous um, mobile sensing units or sensing units which are attached to some form of given mobility, to um, uh, trams, to buses, to cars, um, may help us to, to better and uh, with a higher uh, resolution model air, air pollution and measure air pollution. So then in the first part I showed an example where exactly this was done, uh, where uh, the street view cars were used in order to repeatedly um, measure uh, air pollution levels of some uh, key pollutants were made uh, in, the area, in an area in Oakland and where most importantly uh, one could see that there were huge variations and uh, big differences to the stationary monitor. So that the stationary monitor is not, like, cannot represent very well the diversity of uh, pollution levels that you are exposed to over a full year here. The follow-up study here over two years uh, showed that uh, land use regression models, models where you use uh, knowledge about what happens at different areas um, can reach some to good model can reach good model quality to some extent also with relatively few uh, with, with a relatively small sampling effort uh, but then if you want to get at uh, if you want to reach higher model qualities you really have to sample and you have to sample quite often then I moved into indoor environments, work environments, where I suggested uh, a robot as a way to help us uh, to infer um, gas or in this case uh, particulate matter concentrations from measurements of a stationary sensor network um, for places basically in between there uh, and, and suggested this as a general way in which robots can be uh, used in order to uh, combine their uh, spatially dense measurements with temporally dense measurements in order to achieve something that is quite spatially and temporally dense, giving us 24-7 uh, measurements at the whole area there. 
uh, and uh, allowing us to estimate to how much of uh, this, for, for example, to how high the integrated dust concentrations are a human worker is exposed to over time. I suggested here one specific um, approach using echo state networks and I showed um, that we can get reasonable maps. And I also mentioned that this led us uh, to study ventilation characterization as uh, an application of, of robots. So then uh, for the part uh, autonomous monitoring uh, in under outdoor conditions. I use the example of methane, um, where we have a robot that uses a remote gas sensing um, example, um, and then with uh, a um, tomographic mapping algorithm, uh, is able to um, use a set of those remote measurements in order to come up with a map of localized gas concentrations which in an ideal case allows us to figure out where a gas source is if we have a really good knowledge or if we happen to have a good measurement plan and therefore the rest of this part I talked about um, ways in which we can actually derive such a measurement plan uh, that gives us, that detects all the sources in a given environment uh, and helps us to get a, as good map as possible of the gas distribution there. Um, and then I showed some experiments where we compared a human uh, performance with um, the performance of the algorithm. And then finally, um, I, this is called the holy grail because a, a colleague of mine from Cornell actually once called it like that. It's the holy grail if we, if we manage to include the, the knowledge from physics here given as partial differential equations in the algorithms that the, the robot, the um, gas sensitive robots use. I uh, talked about how the partial differential equations that we use have to be such that we, that we can actually use them online and um, it's necessarily so that they do not fully represent the reality. So there is some model mismatch, which is then um, taken care of by the probabilistic formulation. Uh, there is a distributed um, implementation and the, it's able to classify the uncertainty about the estimate that is then used in order to guide uh, the robot. Um, at that point, I'd also like to mention that um, the co-workers here, so the last part here was done together, I mentioned that already, with DLR here in Munich, especially Thomas Wiedemann and Dimitri Schutin. Uh, this part here, the number four, that was done in, uh, in Erdebrew um, with um, Asif Arain uh, and with Eric Schaffernicht and um, Victor Hernandez. Victor Hernandez uh, is very, was very important in development of the gas spot for which I showed the, the poem. Um, and uh, in the work environment was also Eric Schaffernicht and uh, Victor Hernandez. Okay, this was the summary and with this I'd like to conclude and thank you for your attention. <coughs> Thanks Achim, for this really wonderful talk. I think we, we all would like to have uh, some time for questions, so um, please feel free. Achim will, will probably be happy to, to uh, sure. give you some insights on that. Please. It's probably extremely difficult to miniaturize many of these sensors, because um, they look like complicated devices. Mm -hmm. But Maybe I would like to have your thoughts on what you think would be one single sensor that could be miniaturized and that you would choose if you wanted to give it to consumers, for example, <laughs> to attach it to a mobile phone. And mm. So, so there are gas sensors, uh, there are developments towards uh, bringing gas sensors to mobile phones. Um, but I think that's more driven by um, the, the goal to, you know, to have like some new cool sensor in your mobile phone. It's actually not very clear, you know, like how this would work in your pocket. Uh, and for that, you would rather have in situ sensors. Uh, but the miniaturization, and for them, you know, they, you can actually produce them very small. Uh, 
Um, but the miniaturization aspect is very important also for these remote gas sensors because what I showed was uh, basically an application with, um, um, with ground-based robots that are heavy and that can carry you know, like a relatively heavy sensor as well. Uh, but ideally you, you would also use them with, with um, flying robots, with drones. And that's actually um, a work that I'm currently um, involved in with a PhD student in Berlin from uh, the Federal Agency for Material Testing, BAM. Um, and there we have a miniaturized form of this sensor on a drone so that you can actually, um, like from the air, you can sample the, the area below you. Uh, and that actually has advantages, of course, um, especially since drones have always this advantage that you know you have very nice mobility, you can get very quickly to areas that are of interest, but at the same time they destroy the, the gas distribution that you try to measure, uh, while with a remote sensor you can be, f you know, like pretty far away from it. So th that's that's actually why this was most interesting for us. So miniaturization is very important. I mean, the advantage of having a mobile, having it on a mobile phone would be that it's really with the human being. Yeah. It goes everywhere that the human being goes. Yes. The data is really right. Yeah. From the immediate context of the human being. Yeah, so there, was, there were attempts, there was for example a company called um, Air Quality Egg, um, that's also from the area of Ithaca in, in the US, and uh, they tried to sell, you know, like an, an air pollution monitoring egg, uh, but the problem is if you have um, inexpensive sensors, it's very hard to make sense of the measurements and to calibrate. So. This, this is the issue, I'd say. Please. Yeah, um, is there already some kind of multi-gas sensor? I mean, there are a lot of gas sensors, but they are specialized for one gas. Yeah. Is there something in this? Yes. So the, the way um, this, so, th so there's basically, well, when we present our results, it's either in the robotics community or in the artificial nose community. Uh, electronic nose community, I should say. And um, there, the initial idea and where this term electronic nose, which is maybe to some degree a bit unfortunate, where this comes from is that the general idea is to mimic the, uh, the human or the mammal nose uh, in the sense that you have a range of different uh, sensors, like receptors, with a broad spectrum. And then what you, how you actually recognize uh, odors is by their fingerprint. And in this sense, the, the, the initial idea of an electronic nose, which was um, basically, um, I think, which was published around 1990, uh, is that you have a, a set of different sensors. They, often are built in a way that the sensing principle is similar but you know like because of the sensors are maybe differently doped or so uh, you get slightly different characteristics um, then you actually have something ideally uh, that responds to different chemicals now um, for many of the applications that we have it is crucial that we also know something about the concentrations and those sensors are very hard to calibrate so the, the sensors that are most often used are uh, metal oxide sensors where you basically have something like a, um, an oxidation reaction, so chemical reaction at the surface, which changes depending on what chemicals are there. So you measure a, a resulting resistance, but this resistance actually depends also a little bit on your history. So if you are exposed to a reducing gas, then you see you know, like a drop and then this actually, uh, it takes sometimes a minute until you, know, like this, this, you have fully relaxed from this peak that you have seen. Uh, so it's very hard to estimate abs absolute concentrations. I think one of the, the nicest experiments uh, that we have done in this area is that we combined an electronic nose, um, which can detect different gases and which then tells us, oh, it looks like ethanol, it looks like uh, propanol, with a sensor that is called photoionization detector that gives you uh, concentrations if you know what gas it is. So we use one to recognize and the other to quantify. 
And with that, uh, we were able to create maps of different chemicals with absolute concentrations. But this is otherwise a really hard problem. So yes, there are uh, these sensors. And, and um, like in some European projects, people were building um, measurement units with 10,000 10, sensors. So in order to get to something that is maybe close to biological systems, uh, but it's hard with absolute concentrations. Yeah. Um, from the perspective of how you measure these or source, uh, where the sources are exactly, did you try to out an online extremum seeking algorithm to get to the sources? So, sorry? Extremum seeking? It's like you have a <coughs> sinus curve which is uh, um, yeah, increased or decreased from the, from the uh, attenuation. Mm. Uh, um, so. It's like also used for light sources. Yeah, exactly. Um, then I understood the question correctly. This is actually how uh, the whole community was misguided at the beginning. So um, the, the, the first paper said we discovered a gradient towards the source, and you know just by a few measurements. And then it was uh, decided that yeah, we want to do experiments on gas source localization, but we don't have gas sources, so we use a light source, and here is an algorithm. Now, uh, gases don't exactly dis distribute like that, or disperse like that, and that's why a simple, um, uh, f like a, an algorithm simply find, tries to find the, the maximum, uh, that actually doesn't work. Um, was during my PhD, I did uh, a, a sequence of experiments where I just had um, robots that always followed the immediate gradient, and I just showed that they were a bit faster than when they were walking randomly, but not much to find the source. And this is, this is simply because, well, if you, if you look at uh, cigarette smoke, then there are lots and lots of small um, uh, extreme, like maxima. And um, now you, as a robot, for example, if you, if you have two sensors and you just compare and you say, okay, this sensor here senses more than I go to this direction, um, then you may be, well, o almost all the time you're just in such a local maximum and it's, it's more or less random actually what you're doing. So uh, today, th so that was about 15 years ago, um, when I did those experiments, today the answer would be um, that um, you can probably follow a gradient, but you have to average your measurements over a long time, at, you know, at least minutes. So at each point you would have to average over a long time. Second is that we find indications of gas sources usually uh, much more precisely in maps that show the variance of the measurements. So the variance seems to be a better indicator than the mean, like the, the concentration. And then third, just a few years ago, uh, there was a publication that actually looked at uh, a specific feature, um, which is called bouts, uh, that actually detects more or less how many of those peaks you see. And it seems that following those peaks uh, may be a good direction. And um, we'll see whether this is true. Was, yeah. uh, so um, a big portion of your talk was about the air pollution, mm -hmm. and then you showed um, different uh, types of measuring um, yeah, concentrations and uh, gases and um, localizing the source. So how do you think that robots can then be applied to um, measure or estimate the ambient um, air pollution that we, are, that we talked about in the beginning? So I, I always uh, wanted to um, see the, the experiments that we do as, uh, as independent as possible of the measurement principle. So that I could always say, yeah, well, give me a, a sensor for your particular uh, gas of interest, and then we can apply our, our methods. And I think I can, um, you know, I, can, I, I can go with that for the two different measurements. I have to distinguish the two different measurement principles. If it's a, an in C2 sensor that measures on the spot, that basically tells me what is happening here and uh, where I crucially have to extrapolate to areas close by, where I have to make some assumptions how I do that, uh, that's one area where I can provide solutions. 
but relatively independent of the sensor. And then a, a second is w these remote sensors. For those, I have to have different solutions. Um, and then, uh, with respect to the um, to the in situ sensors that measure a point, basically, there uh, another important distinction is whether they have this uh, hysteresis, where, where you actually see the effects of previous measurements a lot, whether you have to deal with that or not. So other than that, I think as soon as you have uh, a sensor like on the Street View cars, that's very expensive, but uh, also highly accurate, uh, then you can use the same, the same methods. Because you, like in this case, it's, a, it's a, an in situ sensor, and it comes with a very high precision. It doesn't have uh, a long delay uh, of the measurements. So you don't see previous, um, the result of previous measurements in there. And then you can apply one of the methods for sensor planning, for example. OK, so but, um, but do you think it would be possible to um, like incorporate this with the um, model-based um, approach from yeah. Did you show it? So, the, because the first one was like you made an, or they made an experiment like over one year where mm -hmm. they um, drove around the car and this took a really long time. Yeah. So, instead of that, would it be possible to have a team of robots that um, cover the area rather quickly than over the span of one year? I think that would be possible and I'd like to do that. Yeah. Okay. So. Do you think it would be possible with uh, flying or airborne robots? Yeah, with the with the limitations uh, that I mentioned, that actually if you uh, if you have a sensor, um, that in the in situ sensor, then it's usually in, like in the downwash of the rotors, and that may be a problem. But otherwise, um, well, another another thing is that uh, then everything has to be modeled in three D. Uh, which at the moment we decided for a 2D model for computational uh, reasons. Um, but in theory, that, that's not a problem. So currently you do the 2D based approach, meaning you average just about the height. So you don't care about no, the No, the, the, the 2D uh, approach here uh, is basically in the uh, plane where the sensors on the robot are as well. Okay, so you don't care about what is below or above the, no. the plane. No. So it could be like one point measurement. Exactly. Yeah, so there we, we basically investigate gases that are heavier than air and tend to be on the ground. So um, would it, wouldn't it be the same if you have like a flying robot that points down um, like a, um, a beam of light just straight to the ground and you would mm -hmm. get an average mm -hmm. which could also be brought down to the 2D representation? Right? Yeah, that, um, that, that's slightly different, right? Because uh, you, you would still have to integrate over all the... So if you have effects where gas is, is moving up, you would have to take this into account, right? You, you couldn't just say, well, here the, the concentration is small, and then I fly into this uh, zone where gas is going up, and then the concentration is really high because I integrate over all of it. And that wouldn't be um, uh, represented in a 2D equation because this would be higher um, gradients than, you know, like, or these gradients would disperse quicker if it was just 2D. So one would have to actually look into this more. Uh, but in general, it's, it's also um, on the agenda to uh, adapt this for the remote sensors. Yeah, please. Um, you mentioned in the experiment using the uh, non expensive uh, sensor on the other one. But there was a low correlation between the data because of the duration in a high uh, concentration within the environment. But did you, or do you have data and the correlation of the rest of the data where it's, when the sensor does not saturate to see if there's an actual proper measurement when, yes. when it's just a range problem? Yeah, yeah. The, uh, so for the rest of the measurement, it, it looks quite uh, similar. Uh, and uh, some, one, like some reasons. But like one reason why the correlation is not perfect is also because they don't sample exactly at the same place. They just sample close by. Um, so we wouldn't expect a, a, like a perfect correlation there. But it, it, yes, like visual inspection showed it looks very, very similar, except from those peaks. So I only showed the... So 
So the non-expensive sensors could be used for cases when the when the concentration is not as high as, as in this particular case. Yeah. So yeah. And I mean, they, they would then predict r relatively high concentrations there as well, just th they are not able to predict those, those very high peaks. OK, so maybe we have time for one last question. And then, no, no, it's okay. good. Yeah. 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 It's, I think it's a good one. Uh, I was confused on one of the sensors is you, the way you described it, the gas scientists were standing in the room. It looked like there was a reflective surface that was required for the measurement. Um, but then in all the experiments that you showed, it looked like there, there was no reflective surface. Yeah. I'm curious how you got around that problem. Yeah, that's a, that's a really quick one. Uh, you don't need a reflective surface. Like you can, you can point to, to grass and you get enough reflection. So actually the measurement principle, if I understood that correctly, is that you, um, you send out two beams. One tells you about the, uh, the total uh, reflection taken into account uh, the absorption from methane. And the other one tells you about how reflective the endpoint is, because of that you have to also take into account. Great. So I, I know there is probably many, many more questions, but uh, be reminded that Achim is uh, here till remind me again the 9th of, 9th, February. 9th of February. So if there's questions you would like to discuss and other exchanges, I guess uh, you are more than open to that.